The Secret of Conde Hermanos, Chapter 28 Gwen heard the story of Vivaldi over Sala de Nicose at the faculty club the following Thursday, as promised, and it was circuitous tale with hair-raising twists and turns. But the actual conclusions seemed to be so absolutely unfathomable to Gwen. She attempted to digest the outcome very slowly, not quite sure she had even heard it correctly. The story began about two years ago with the premature passing of Vivaldi's predecessor, a pug named Scarlatti, who had succumbed to a complication from a soft palate defect at the tender age of four and a half. Over the course of my life, Peter explained, I've lost several dogs, and it's never easy, no matter what the circumstances, but somehow Scarlatti's death was exacerbated for me by his youth. He, in my mind, was simply too young to cease to exist. He, who had not yet even hit his stride and was so full of vitality, it all seemed to me a miscarriage of justice on a grand scale, and I consequently fell into the depression. Though I presumed I hid it well, my colleagues nevertheless assured me that I was but a shadow of my former self, concerned for my welfare, attempted over and over to find another pug for me. This was all to no avail, for I simply wasn't ready. Then, about six months ago, they found on the internet a pug puppy in Oklahoma who was in dire need of a home. It was the last pup in a litter whose breeder had suddenly died that same week. His sister, in the midst of all her bereavement responsibilities, and upon hearing of my own loss vis-a-vis -vis my colleagues, offered to send the puppy free of charge at her own expense. She contracted breeders she knew in Northern California who would then drive him down as far as Bakersfield, and all I had to do was drive up and get him. I told my colleagues I couldn't possibly drive that distance, so they simply countered my resistance by insisting on doing it for me. They drove up two days later to a prearranged IHOP where a rendezvous took place, and they hand-delivered the puppy to me at the music library later that same day, Peter said, neatly popping a cherry tomato into his mouth. That's a true odyssey, Gwen proposed in utter amazement. And did your depression lift as well? Immediately, as a matter of fact, Peter went on, after a sip of a uh, Pellegrino, mostly because I felt, strangely enough, that Scarlatti was being given another chance in another body. My vet, you see, had told me not to rule out the possibility. He was a special man who believed deeply in transmigration of souls, or metapsychosis, as he also called it. Everyone in the music department took their animal to him because he was not only a very humane and caring vet, but an accomplished musician as well. He even kept his guitar in the examining room and practiced in between patient appointments. He loved Chacone by Bach and played it surprisingly well. It's a piece, as you know, I'm sure, that puts fear in one's soul. His name was Dr. Cordero, Carlos Cordero, as I recall. God rest his soul. Pardon me, Peter, Gwen said, standing suddenly to excuse herself, and then murmured, I'll be right back. Feeling lightheaded, she walked away in search of the ladies' room. The impromptu performance Gwen had, that Gwen had attended afterward with Peter was all that he had promised, and never so much, ever so much more. Indeed, it was the legendary Argentine pianist Martha Agravich who appeared that day in the simple utilitarian stage of a modest 500-seat Schollenberg Hall. Modest, that is, compared with the opulent Royce Hall, located just across the lawn. Those attendants who had been trying unsuccessfully for years to book Martha Agarazzi, she, in fact, had not appeared anywhere near Los Angeles for over a decade. The concert was a free event to anyone who happened to be so fortunate as to just walk in the door. It was, in actuality, not a concert at all, but a loving 70th birthday present from Martha Agarice to her dear friend and colleague, Russian pianist Vitale Margulis, who had joined the UCLA School of Music five years ago. Although Agarice 
was well known for her aversion to both press and publicity, which had kept her safely out of the limelight for most of her career, she was nevertheless considered the greatest pianist of the second half of the 20th century, and, in spite of her ways, appearing in concert only rarely, releasing but a handful of solo recordings, sometimes showing up as a soloist with an orchestra, but more often than not cancelling at the last minute. Her mercurial virtuosity reverberated throughout the world of classic music. The first half of the concert began with an impressive performance by five Margulis UCLA students and was followed by Edgar Rich, who accompanied Vitali's daughter, cellist Natasha Bugalis, and then played the piano concert duets with her son, Hura. The jewel of the crown of the afternoon, however, was an arrangement for two pianos by Nicolas Ecomunou of the Nutcracker Suite, which was delivered in, to Agarich's daughter, Stephanie, and Ilmanou's daughter, Semel. It was a personal family affair from the start to finish, and one in which Agarich appeared to enjoy herself immensely with her customary dazzle and frightening precision. She led her young accompanists on a merry chase. The more they panted to keep up, the more she laughed with delight. It was during Chopin's Polanese Brillante for cello and piano that Peter instinctively grabbed Gwen's hand and smiled broadly, as if to indicate the sheer magnitude of power contained in the waves of sound that were washing over the entire auditorium. Afterward, over coffee, in the faculty club, he simply remarked, Feral. Feral? Gwen asked, a bit puzzled. Yes, that's the word most commonly flung when they're describing the tam talent of Martha Agarice. It's quite accurate, don't you think? Gwen nodded, letting the full meaning of the words sink in. She's so visceral in her approach, so impulsive yet perfectly exquisite. After exposure to something like that, I doubt I'll ever be the same. No, you won't, Peter confirmed her suspicion, nor will I. Our molecules have been rearranged. It's a phenomenon that she's well known for. She doesn't interpret music, she embodies it. That effect is phenomenal, Gwen said, at a loss for any other adjective. However, Peter digressed, winking and clearing his throat, coming back down to earth for a moment, I thought I'd mention our Baroque ensemble has a great gig at the Getty Museum next Thursday. Seems there's a trustees meeting with wine and cheese in the interatrum, and afterwards I'd like you to come as my guest. We've been asked to play with Winter and Spring from Vivaldi's Four Seasons as kind of homage to the time of year as well as a tribute to one of the most beloved paintings in the museum collection, Spring, by Laurence Adam Dasma. Are you familiar with it? I am, actually, Gwen admitted, feeling slightly dizzy again. There's a copy hanging in the house where I live. It was a gift of the deceased owner to his wife, and had great sentimental value for him. Oh, said Peter, sniffing the air like a bloodhound getting a fresh scent. Then he was a man after my own heart, was he? A hopeless romantic. What, out of curiosity, was the good man's name? Dr. Cordero. Gwen blushed, smiling sheepishly. Dr. Carlos Cordero. And why, might I ask, Peter continued triumphantly, am I not surprised? <laughs>